She hath opened her hand to the needy, and stretched out her hands to the poor. She shall not fear for her house in the cold of snow. Devotion to the Blessed Virgin began in early Christianity and serves to glorify God while leading Christians to mold their lives to God's will. Christ is always at the center. Over the centuries, she has been called Our Mother of Perpetual Help, Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Immaculate Conception. By any name, she is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. One of her earliest titles is Our Lady of the Snows. This devotion traces its origin all the way back to fourth century Rome, where it is said a miraculous snowfall covered a hilltop on a hot August night. Legend tells us that in the year 358, a Roman patrician named John and his wife decided to give all their earthly goods to the church and prayed to Mary for guidance. The Mother of God answered by appearing in a dream to both the devout couple and Pope Liberius, asking that a basilica be built in her honor in a place that she would miraculously indicate. On the morning of August 5th, a typically steamy summer day, Romans were stunned to find snow covering the Esquiline Hill. As the faithful watched, the Pope traced in the newly fallen snow the outline of the future church, which would be called Santa Maria Ad Nevis, Our Lady of the Snows. Over the centuries, the name and the building have changed, but Our Lady of the Snows, the basilica erected in honor of the Virgin Mary and her miracle, remains Christendom's first Marian shrine for pilgrims and a source of untold blessings and graces. Beyond the legend, the choice of where to build the church perhaps had some human influence. History tells us that the Esquiline Hill had been settled by barbarian troops who were largely Arian, and Pope Liberius was a firm crusader against the Arian heresy. By erecting a church in honor of Mary on the site, perhaps the Pope wished to promote Mary as Mother of God against this Arian belief that denied that Jesus was both a divine and human person. In time, the original basilica fell into ruin, but it continued to play an important symbolic role in the controversy regarding Jesus' divinity and humanness. In 431, the church condemned the heresy of Nestorius, which believed that Jesus was two persons, a human person conceived in time, and a divine person from all eternity, and that Mary was not the mother of God, the divine person, but only the mother of Jesus, the human person. The Council of Ephesus affirmed that Jesus was one person, truly God and truly man. Mary, being the mother of the divine person Jesus, was also the mother of God. To commemorate the declaration of Mary's divine motherhood, Pope Sixtus III rebuilt Our Lady of the Snows. The new and more magnificent basilica was renamed St. Mary Major, and it remains the oldest church in the West dedicated to the honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary and one of four papal basilicas in Rome. Visitors come from all over the world to pray before the icon known as Salus Populi Romani, a sign of certain hope in the guidance and protection of Mary, the Mother of God. This ancient Marian image has its own legend regarding its origin. According to the story, after the crucifixion, Mary moved to the home of St. John, where her portrait was painted by St. Luke. The icon is painted on a thick cedar slab and is five feet high by three and a quarter feet wide. Mary wears a gold-trimmed, dark blue mantle over a red tunic. Jesus rests on her left arm. 
In his left hand, he holds a book, and his right arm is slightly raised in blessing. Most images depict Mary pointing to Christ, but in this one, Mary's right hand crosses over her left in a gentle embrace of her child. Mary is depicted as the woman who looks to the people, drawing them with her gaze to center on her divine Son. Jesus blesses the people she looks at, and he looks at her, his mother, as one of them, but particularly as the one who shared most intimately in his incarnation. Miraculous stories of the image's ability to protect abound. In the fifth century, it is said Pope Gregory the Great carried the icon through Rome, praying for deliverance from the Black Plague. According to legend, at the end of the prayers, the figure of St. Michael the Archangel appeared suddenly over the mausoleum of Hadrian, known today as Castle Sant'Angelo, indicating that the pestilence was ended. The grateful Roman population called the icon Salus Populi Romani, or Health of the Roman People. Appropriately, this icon rests in a special chapel in St. Mary Major. But Our Lady of the Snows is not just a fascinating chapter in church history. This unique devotion remains a vital part of our present and future faith lives. Half a world away from Rome, in the American Midwest, with the financial support of the faithful, the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate built the National Shrine of Our Lady of the Snows in 1958. It reflects a desire to share this devotion and to honor the many oblates who have given their lives to take Christ's message to people living in remote lands of snow and ice. While there is no miracle associated with the building of this shrine, the Oblates association with Our Lady of the Snows began with a man who was himself the stuff of legends, Oblate Father Paul Schulte, known to all as the flying priest over the Arctic. Born in Germany in 1896, Paul Schulte's seminary training was interrupted with the outbreak of World War I. He was drafted into the army and became a pilot. After the war, Schulte returned to the seminary and was ordained an oblate priest in 1922. For the next several years, Father Schulte spent time as a missionary in Africa and traveling to raise funds for the Missionary International Vehicular Foundation, which provided missionaries with vehicles for their work. He made history in 1936 when he received papal permission to celebrate the world's first aerial mass on the famous airship Hindenburg. In 1937, Father Schulte was transferred to northern Canada, where he utilized his skills as a pilot to fly his specially equipped ski plane from one remote mission to another, celebrating mass, delivering supplies, and performing medical evacuations. Like all missionaries working under harsh conditions, Father Schulte struggled with hardship. But as the following letter shows, he found strength and inspiration in the prayers and loving example of his mother. My dear good mother, your last letter with its promise of your prayers brought me great consolation. I had written you that I was going through a hard trial. Thank you for your special prayers. Suffering is a touchstone, especially in the most critical hours of life. A philosophy and a religion which can fill our hearts with heroic courage, even in the midst of heartbreaking sorrow and anguish, is one that proves its worth and truth. It is your example, dear mother, the remembrance of suffering heroically born for love of God, which I took with me into the Arctic. But amidst the struggle and difficulties, Father Schulte also found inspiration and God's presence in the stark beauty of the Arctic. He wrote, No phenomenon was more electrifying than the Northern Lights. One February night in 1937, I stood for a long time on a small wooden bridge 
also the temperature was 40 degrees below zero. The glorious celestial display of the northern lights that night was unforgettable. How great must be our Creator! Father Schulte imagined Our Lady of the Snows appearing over the northern lights, describing to his mother the image he would introduce to the Inuit people and commission a painter to create. She is pictured coming down from heaven and holding her son to gaze at the astonished Eskimos. The rays of the northern lights fold about her like an iridescent mantle floating down from the sky toward the everlasting ice and snow below her. This heavenly cloak of the Madonna covers the figures of the kneeling Eskimos, men, girls and mothers with their babes in their arms. On the right, the heavenly cloak of northern lights pass over my airplane and myself, bringing the Eucharist. Father Schulte might have spent the rest of his life flying between missions in the Arctic Circle had it not been for the outbreak of World War II. When the war began, a tide of fear swept the nation. Innocent Japanese Americans were put into internment camps. Some German-born residents also found themselves under suspicion. And so the flying priest over the Arctic found himself grounded by the U.S. government and ordered in turn for the duration of the war at St. Henry's Oblate Seminary in Belleville, Illinois. Not one to sit idle, Father Schulte, along with a young Oblate by the name of Father Edwin Guild, cultivated devotion to the Blessed Mother under the title of Our Lady of the Snows. They founded the Missionary Association of Mary Immaculate so that others could share in the good works of the Oblates. Lay men and women, through their prayers, works of charity, and financial contributions aided the missionary oblate priests and brothers in educating seminarians, building churches, assisting the poor, and bringing hope to those in need. Visitors to the seminary were captivated by Father Schulte's painting of Our Lady of the Snows. New life sprang from this ancient devotion as the Oblates inaugurated their perpetual novena to her in 1943. In 1951, the first solemn outdoor novena was held, with the final day being celebrated on August 5th, the Feast of Our Lady of the Snows. Eventually, all of this culminated in the building of a national shrine in 1958. Beyond the legend, Faithful and generous people continue to be inspired by the person and example of Mary, who said yes to God's call. In all her many titles and images around the world, in every language and culture, Our Lady of the Snows is a mother, a protectress who spreads her mantle over all her children to bring them into the light of faith. Mm -hmm.